Now, I want you to think about you a year from now. I know today's the first day of 24, but I want you to think for a minute about the first, or the first Sunday of 24. Think about the first Sunday of 25. What difference do you want to have in your life between now and then? Some of you want to be 20 pounds lighter, right? <laughs> some of you want to be 20 years younger. I don't know if you can do that one. Uh, but there's some specific things. Maybe there's some questions you hope to have solved, some problems you've solved. Maybe there's some spiritual uh, steps that you've made, some relationship uh, changes that you want to see made in you next year. Well, it comes down to one word, and that word is commitment. Everyone say it with me, commitment. Now, here's the commitment I want. I want to begin with myself. The commitment I want to make with you is that I want to take our church, our church faith family. A church is not a building. It's not an organization. It's not even a list of names. It's a faith family. I want to take our faith family deeper into the word of God and the presence of God than we have ever been before. That's my commitment to you. I didn't just think that up. I heard that from heaven. That's what God wants us to do. We're going through the Bible together as a church in a way strategically like we never have before. All right, and I'm going to explain that to you today. But I want to say at the offset, it's going to be nothing unless you make the commitment as well. You have to commit that this is my faith family. And the things that we challenge you to do are first to worship together. That's what we're doing today. We're gathering 52 Sundays a year. We will worship together. And you might have to be on vacation. You might have to be out of town. You might be sick, but you can watch it online. You can catch up. I want to ask you to commit that you're going to hear 52 messages from this pulpit because they're not random. It is a curriculum that the Holy Spirit is placing us on. And I want to, I want to make sure we're hearing what God has to say. Worship. Everybody say worship. Corporate gathered worship. Secondly, we want everybody to serve in some capacity. And the way you do that is you go to next steps and you, you join in the body of the family. You know, you understand who you are and where you fit and you serve. Now, you can serve every Sunday. There are people that are just, you know, they are ninjas in here. They're serving every service every Sunday. We put most people on a rotation. Maybe you serve by going one week this year on a mission trip. Or maybe your best way to serve is to lead a small group or just to be on a serve team. You go build a wheelchair ramp for a disabled person. But there is a way, no matter what your schedule is, to serve. And oh, by the way, let's not just assume that the schedule you lived in 2023 is really the kind of schedule God wants you to lead in 2024. If we really started putting our whole life before the cross, how many of you know God would start talking to us about our schedule? He's dealt with me about it a lot, okay? We want you serving. We want you giving. I want you to be able to give and be a part of something that's bigger than yourself. I mean, don't just live your life for yourself. You know, when we give, we do things together that we could never do by ourselves. This week, my wife got to meet a young lady who has four children. Her, her ex-husband is in rehab. He's no help to the family. She's raising these four children. She happens to be very sick right now. She has double pneumonia. They don't have adequate heating in the house. This week, we're able to provide heating for them, buy groceries for them, get them gas. We're connecting with people that's going to help them in the future. And all of that came through the Choose Life Fund when our church said, you know what, if you are a mother or someone who chose life, you decided not to have an abortion, you decided to raise children, you didn't give up your children. You will not have to do that alone. This church will stand by you. That couldn't happen. I could say it, but it couldn't happen unless y'all gave. We've invested somewhere around $150,000 in moms and people, grandparents taking care of children. Isn't that awesome? And it's just the beginning. And if you know someone in need, it was so funny when it, when it broke on, on the media, uh, Huntsville News Station uh, did a report and when they put it on their social media, somebody, you know, people get angry when you help others crazy. They're like, I hope every single mother in North Alabama calls y'all. And I was like, yeah, <laughs> that's the plan, you know. But, yeah, but, but what, what I'm saying is when, when you get in, in a family, a faith family, you get to do things that you could never do by yourself. And so this year, I want to challenge you to commit fully to be a part of this church. And if you will, your life will be radically different. The you that we see next year will be radically different. Now, we're going to go through the Bible systemically from February through uh, December, and we're going to do it in here. 
uh, on those Sundays where we preach, but it's going to match what we are teaching in children's church, and it's going to match what we're teaching in student ministries, and it's going to match many of our small groups. There'll be daily devotions. Think about it this way. Your family can be having dinner if it's every night a week or at least maybe one night a week. You could sit together and talk about what you're all learning together and grow as a family and ask yourself, how does this apply to our lives? I'm so excited about that. And that begins in February. And the reason we're, we held it to February is so that we could set aside January for our annual 21 days of prayer and fasting. And I hope you're excited about this. What we're going to do, you're on day one already. Congratulations. You've already started because on the Sundays, all you do is come to church, okay, like normal. We pray and we worship together. But then Monday through Friday, we have a one-hour prayer service, full band worship prayer time at 6 a.m. from 6 to 7. Now, I know some of your spirit just went, oh, my God. And I'm going to tell you the hardest part of it is the five minutes after the alarm clock goes off. If you can beat that, you will love it, okay? Because it is jet fuel for your day, for your whole week. It is so powerful. No, am I right? Has anybody ever been to 21? Am I right? I mean, it takes you to a whole new level. So I want to challenge you to do it on Saturdays. It's at 9, okay? So you get to sleep later on Saturdays. And it's just three quick weeks. And it is, it is life changing. If you, if you force yourself to do it, you will not regret it. It is online. If, you're, uh, if you have a commute or something like that, you can listen while you drive or whatever. Um, and then we're going to fast. I want to encourage you to think about that. Some of you, you don't really know what that means to fast. It means to set aside something. Um, it, usually it's been food. Um, and there's a, we've got a, a pace, place on our webpage. It's in your notes. If you want to read more about different kinds of fasts that you might consider, I just want to say this. I don't think fasting is paying God to do something for you. I don't think that's what that is. I'm going to go hungry so God will financially bless me. I, you know, I'm fasting for a, a pay raise. I, I hear that kind of stuff all the time. And if it works for you, praise God, pay the tithes on that pay raise. We'll receive it. Okay. I just don't think that's what it's meant for. For me, I get the most out of fasting when I look at my life and I say, what part of this world is encroaching on my walk with God? And how can I put it aside? I mean, how can I just destroy it for 21 days? You know, for instance, social media, I think, encroaches on our time with God and family and, and, and more, more valuable things, work, so many things that are more valuable. Uh, and, and, you know, when you fast, you just say, man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to not cut back on it. I'm going to put my boot on the neck of that enemy. For, for others, I, I made a list of some things that came to my mind. It might be unhealthy music that's not good for you. Uh, it could be friendships that you know are not uh, moving you in the right direction. could be unhealthy habits like food. That, you, that, that that's just unhealthy in your life, or alcohol, or tobacco, or pornography. By the way, if you have any porn in your life, it's unhealthy. There shouldn't be any porn in your life. But 21 days is a great time to go, you know what, in the next 21 days, I'm going to reboot my life, I'm going to reset my schedule, and I'm going to come out of this in a healthier way. And social media and all those others are a great way to do that. You pray about that, okay? You make that decision. Maybe it's a food fast. There's a lot of those on there. Some of you are thinking right now, I didn't know it started today. I had a cinnamon bun. I guess I'm out. I'm going to hell. I can't be blessed in 24. That's not how this works, okay? You start today. You might be like me. First fast I went on, I was on a liquid-only fast, and I was also selling peanut M&Ms for the children's church. I'll save you the story, but it didn't work. I'll just say that. I didn't make it. All right? So you, you don't have to be perfect on that, okay? Give it your very best, all right? And uh, this year, we're going to have something we call the Bible Engagement Project. Uh, where we fully go deeper in the Word of God. I'm going to start tomorrow morning at 6 a.m. at 21 Days of Prayer talking about the word deeper. Uh, but that's the word God's given me for our church. And we're going to go deeper into God's Word. And, and why is that? Because that's the source. God's Word is alive. It transforms you. It's not like any other book. Hebrews chapter 4 says the Word of God is alive. Say these two words with me. It's alive and it's powerful. It's not like some book you pick up and say, well, maybe I'll pick this item up or I'll do this uh, principle. It's not like that. It's not like a leadership book. It's not like a self-help book. It's, it's eternal. Now, the, the, God's word, Jesus said that, my, that heaven and earth may pass away, but my word will never pass away. 
And so it's, it's forever going to be powerful in your life. Let me give you some advice about how to deal with God's word in 2024 and beyond. Number one, accept its authority. Accept that this is the voice of God in my life. It's been said that the Bible's not given for information, but transformation. When I read this, I'm not picking and choosing. This is good. This is not going to help me. I'm going to try that. I may not try the other. No, I'm looking at this as the authority, the authoritative word of God in my life. Paul said it like this. We also thank God continually because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as what? Not as human word, but as it actually is as what? Word of God which is indeed at work in you who believe. It's at work in you. I mean, when you, when you read a chapter of the Bible, you stop working after you stop reading. Okay, your lips aren't moving anymore. Your brain may not be thinking about it anymore. But look at it. It's still at work in you. It continues to work. God's word is active and alive. And when you release it into your life, it continues to change you. And you don't need to take it or leave it. You need to take it as this is God's 100% authority for my life. You need to be like the little girl who was sitting on the airplane uh, next to a stranger. She's reading her little book and it's a kid's church book about Jonah and the whale. The stranger's looking over there and he says, what is that? Is that that story from the Bible? She said, yeah. He said, you don't really believe that a whale swallowed a man and he survived, do you? She said, I sure do, because it's in the Bible. And he said, well, you'll never really know if that's the truth or not. And she said, I will, because I'm going to ask Jonah when I get to heaven. And he said, well, what if Jonah didn't make it to heaven? She said, well, then you can ask him. <laughs> that's the kind of faith you need to have right there. I know what the book says, and I don't care what you think about it, okay? Okay. I mean, the biggest difference between your Bible and every other book is that the Bible finds you where you are. Every other book, you're trying to decide, okay, I'm trying to figure out how to lose weight. Which book do I, a keto book, do I want to buy the, you know, a uh, hit training book, the, uh, it's high intensity. Uh, you're trying to figure out which book is for you. This book, you just decide systemically, I'm going to open it up and read it every day. I'm going to listen to it in my commute every day. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it in my life through worship music every day. It will find you. You'll be amazed at how the very thing you've been thinking about, the thing you've been worried about, the thing that you've been consumed with, God's word will illuminate and speak to you. And, and you know, it's not just God's word, it's God's people. It's this faith family. It's in a small group. It's in a worship song. It's in a sermon. It's in the lobby when you talk to someone. It's when the prayer team praise over you, you will be amazed how often right what you need happens just when you need it. Has anybody ever experienced what I'm talking about? The supernatural right now of God. I mean, it's amazing how God's word and God's presence will find you. So decide right now. This is the year of the Bible for our church. We're going we're gonna to focus on it. Decide right now. This is the authority for my life. And you'll get the most out of it you can. Here's the second thing. Assimilate the Bible's truths. Assimilate. I'm going to leave it up here for a minute. It's not a word that we use very often, but it means to make it a part of your system. I mean, just take it in completely and decide this is the truth for my life and I'm going to build my life around this truth. You know, one time we had some guests staying in our home and their values and their standards weren't exactly like ours and so there were some things we didn't allow in our home and uh, it was a little awkward to tell them that, and, and, and I remember them saying something like, well, it's just so hard to you know, figure out, so confusing to figure out what you guys are okay with in this house, and I thought, it's really not co confusing at all. I mean, we just try to do exactly what the book says. We try to make our standards be as close to what the standards of Scripture are as we possibly can. Actually, people who don't use the Bible as a standard, that's what's confusing because what was okay yesterday is not okay tomorrow. What we believed in this day, we don't believe. Are you understanding what I'm talking about? The world. And, and see, if you will just make God's Word your standard and make the truth of God's Word your truth, it will simplify your life, your relationships. It will simplify your parenting style what is right and what is wrong. As you get older, decisions get harder and harder and harder. 
I mean, you, you become a preteen and you start deciding who your friends are going to be. You become a teenager and you drive. You start deciding where you're going to go. And you get some freedom. You go to college. and Man, the biggest decisions of your life happen around 18 to 25 to, to 30 years old. Huge decisions. After that, you're deciding things about your kids. And, and, and if you don't have a standard, man, life is going to be so complicated and so difficult. If, on the other hand, you have said, okay, God is the creator of of life. This is the roadmap for my life. This is going to be my standard. I don't mean a dead rule book where people can judge you by it, but it's life speaking into you wisdom every day. It'll simplify and bless your life. I'm preaching better than y'all are. Amen. And I'm t- <laughs> step it up. Revelation 1 and 3 says, happy is the one who reads the book and obeys what is written into it. I want you to get, let the scripture get deep inside your soul this year. And, and memorize the scripture. I, I wish you'd carry the Bible more this year. I hope I'm going to try to do a better job at that. Take it with you. I have deep memories when I was a teenager and I went to work at, <clears throat> in the summer and over the Christmas break. I worked at the, uh, the, the, the manufacturing plant where my dad worked. And uh, dad had on his little uniform with a pocket and he always had his little Bible, little Gideon Bible in his, in his front pocket. And he'd read that on break every day. He'd read from the Psalms or the Proverbs or the New Testament every day. And it just reminded me, what if you became a little bit more of a Bible thumper this year? I don't, I don't mean you're judging people, but you carried your Bible with you. You brought it to church. You read it regularly. Maybe, maybe in the next 21 days, what if you deleted all of your social media apps on your phone and put that Bible app right there in the middle? And every time that you knee-jerk react to, to pull that phone up, you hit the Bible app. You'd see what a change it would make in your life. And if, if, if in church, some, some part of the message or some scripture spoke to you, and, and it should happen every weekend, okay? What if you took that verse and you wrote it down somewhere? Maybe you, you cut it out and you taped it on your refrigerator or you put it somewhere in your car where you'd see it every time you got in it or you put it on your mirror and try to memorize that scripture. It's amazing how when you, when you put the scriptures to memory in your life, they'll come up in your spirit just when you need them. Why? Because the word of God is alive. Right when you need it, that word will come up. Let me show you some of the benefits of memorizing scripture. Okay, first of all, it helps me resist temptation. The Bible says I've hidden God's word in my heart that I might not sin against it. Just about the time you're about to blab your mouth something you're not supposed to say, God's word will come and you'll be like, no. Wouldn't that be awesome? How many of in this room have, all right, we're just going to start out, okay, by confession time. How many in this room have ever blabbed something out of your mouth and just as it left your lips, you knew that was the wrong thing to say? There was a scripture, had it been marinating at that moment, that would have probably kept you from saying that dumb thing and kept you out of that trouble, right? This is what David is saying. I've hidden his word in my heart. Second thing it does for you, it helps me make wise decisions. Your word is a lamp to guide me and a light for my path. Think about it like this. What David is trying to illustrate to you is that this is a dark world. You don't know what you're going to trip over next. You don't know if your next step is going to put you in a hole uh, or you're going to fall off a cliff. But God's word, what does it do? It illuminates. Students, you're trying to make a decision. Is is this the right person? Is this? What what if you're, you're thinking about dating a guy? And, and you're, 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 you're telling your, uh, your, your dad is, uh, but, but dad, he's got such a good heart. Oh, I know he's uh, crazy and, and he smokes a lot of dope, but you don't understand he has a good heart. <laughs> well, there's a verse that says to not be unequally yoked or connected with unbelievers. What if you read that verse and you knew that that was the lamp you needed to know that, hey, I'm not going to date this guy until he's the right kind of, oh, but he's going to complete me complete me. I, see, I'm, I'm, I'm messing myself up. I've got my own trigger words. I can trigger myself. I'm going to try not to go there today. Okay. But if you know God's word, it puts light on the path. And just before you make a bad choice, it'll illuminate it for you. Here's the third thing. It strengthens me when I'm under stress. We'll skip that because nobody here is under stress. You know that America's more stressed today than ever in history? Did you know that America is, has less mental health right now than we had during the Great Depression? We are stressed out people. The Bible says God's promises are hope. They are my hope. They give me strength in all my troubles. And oh, how they refresh and revive me. 
Some of you are thinking to yourself, I'd love to have more hope. I'd love to be refreshed. I'd love to be revived. Well, you need to know his promises. You need to be reading every single day and you'll find that they will find you just when you need them if you read it every day. It comforts me when I'm sad. Jeremiah said, God, your words are what sustain me. They bring me joy to my sorrowing heart and they delight me. You know what Jeremiah was called? His nickname was the weeping prophet. He, he, he well, dealt with a lot of sadness in his life and he said, you know what sustains me? It's God's word. All right, uh, the next one is it causes me to prosper. Those who are meditating, not just read it once a week, sit down and hear the preacher preach, and I like that song and I like that sermon, but they're meditating. They're reading it. They're quoting it. They're remembering it. They're like trees along riverbanks bearing fruit. They will never wither, and whatever they do will prosper. That's a verse right there. I said something about copying verses down, maybe making a copy and cutting it out and taping it somewhere. That's a verse right there everybody here ought to memorize. It's the first psalm. It's easy to remember. Because it makes a promise to you that if you engage with God's word, if you live God's word, he's going to put you by, uh, by a riverbank where you're always bearing fruit and you are never going to wither and you are always going to prosper. You ought to pray that prayer back to him. The next time your finances are in a mess, hey, God, I'm standing on your word. You said I'm going to prosper no matter what I do. You start a new business, it's not going well. God, your word says whatever I do will prosper. And you engage with God in that conversation, this will be not only a prophetic uh, uh, supernatural prayer in your life, but it'll be an open conversation where God can lead you into a path of blessing over your business, your family, whatever it is you're praying about. Somebody say amen for me. I'm getting me excited. All right, it helps me witness to unbelievers. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you the reason for the hope that you have. If you know God's word, you can share what God has done in your life. So I'm gonna apply these things to my life and that's the third and last thing I wanna share with you today. Apply the Bible's principles. Don't just look at them as words on a page, but walk them out in your life. There was a, uh, was a famous comic over 100 years ago. He was, uh, he was real rude and crude and um, uh, he was egotistical and he was near death. He's on his deathbed in the hospital when somebody came to visit him and they found him thumbing through the Bible. And they asked him, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm looking for loopholes. How many know there's no loopholes? That's not the way the Bible's meant to be anyways. It's not like a, a, a combination. If I say these right words, I pray these right prayers, I get into heaven. No, it, it's meant to speak to your everyday life. James says if you read the Bible and you don't do what the Bible says, you, you fool yourself. You, you'll, you'll deceive your own self. You'll think, well, I, I did a good thing. I went to church, but nothing's changed in my life. Let me show you a few things the Bible will do for you. If you're in a battle, you read this promise. God says, I've given you authority to trample snakes and scorpions and overcome all the power of the enemy and nothing will harm you and everybody said. You, you, you take that verse right there. Some of you need to take these notes that I've given you and cut that one verse out and stick it somewhere so you'll remember it. If you're having money problems, some of you need to pray this prayer. My God will meet all of your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. And somebody said... Amen. That's your promise. You need to memorize that verse this year. If you're afraid, <clears throat> the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord's the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? And everybody said, Amen. if you're dealing with fear, if you can't sleep at night, you need to take that verse and quote it over yourself. What if you laid in bed and you just quoted that verse over and over and over again until you fell asleep? That's your promise. If you're sick, Jesus said, the Bible says of, of, of the Lord, he forgives all your sins and heals all, not some, but all of your diseases. And everybody said, amen. amen. What if you prayed over yourself, you prayed over your loved one, that verse time and time again. And when you feel alone and when you feel completely powerless, one of my favorite places in scriptures is in the book of Romans. It says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Here's a list of things that might try to trouble, hardship, persecution, famine, nakedness, this is poverty, danger or sword. No, in all these things we are, everybody shout, more than conquerors. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us and somebody say amen. amen. Give God praise for his promise, for his truth. 
This is just a brief sampling of all the promises God's word speaks over you. Some of you, you look at the Bible and it scares you. You look at it and it makes you feel guilty because you, you feel like it's this big high tower and you're not deserving of it. Let me just put your mind at ease. None of us will ever be deserving of God's love, his kingdom, his grace, his word. That's not what it's meant to be. It's meant to be a place for us to relax and rest in his presence. So I want to challenge you to fall in love with God's word this year, to fully engage with this church in worship, in serving, in giving, in 21 days of prayer, which begins tomorrow morning. Be involved in that. And if you say, okay, how, how do I get there? Let, let, me, let me stop with this. Let me, let me end today. We're going we're gonna to share a communion as a faith family. I preached kind of fast today, if you couldn't tell. I, I'm, I'm at the end because I made room for us to, uh, to pray over your families and, and share communion with you. But I want to tell you this. I don't want you to get a list of all the things I've said today like a checklist. And if I do all these things, God will finally love me. I'll finally be able to be blessed if I'll, if I'll do enough good deeds. Let me tell you, this does not begin with you getting better at doing good things. This begins at the cross. Everything God did begins at the cross. It's where we say, utterly, I'm not able, God. I'm utterly incapable. You know, you're not going to do 21 days in a row of anything just right. You just can't. You're fallen. You're human. We're fleshly. We're imperfect. It's not about that. It's about coming back to the cross every time and saying, God, I trust you again. I lean on your grace one more time. God, I ask for your forgiveness one more time and knowing that he's going to love you. And I want to tell, somebody needs to hear that today because maybe this whole message, everything I've been talking about doing, you think, man, I'm a million miles away from that. How could I ever get there? Start at the cross. 